Six centuries ago, the world was a much different place than it is today. In Europe, castles overlooked the countryside, and most people knew little about the world beyond their own small communities, no matter whether they lived in Europe, in Asia, or in Africa. In fact, in the 1400s, most people still thought the world was flat, and understanding of geography was so poor that the best map of the world was over 1,000 years old, having been made not long after the time of Christ. But by the end of the 1400s, knowledge of the world and its people improved rapidly as more and more ships set out from European ports to explore unknown regions of the earth during the great age of discovery. Now, let us learn why and how this incredible period of history came to be. In the 1400s, the age of discovery got started for one main reason the fact that Muslim nations controlled the rich trade in silks, spices, jewels, and porcelains from the great Asian civilizations of the Far East, a trade that few European countries were allowed to share in. The Muslim nations could control this trade because they ruled key land between Europe and the great trading centers of Eastern Asia, and they refused to let European Christians pass through them. Muslim traders brought goods from the Far East in two ways. By camel caravans thousands of miles overland, or in small ships from India, which crossed the Indian Ocean into the Red Sea. From Red Sea ports, Asian goods usually were carried overland to the Nile River where they went by ship down the river to the Mediterranean Sea. Once they reached the Mediterranean ports, the Muslim traders would sell their goods only to merchants from the Italian city-states of Genoa and Venice. And the Italian merchants then brought the Asian goods to Europe, where they were resold for a big profit. And because of this, both of these city-states grew rich and powerful. Other European countries wanted to share in the wealth brought by trade in Asian spices and silks, but the Italian and Muslim traders refused to let them in. This was why in the early 1400s, Spain and Portugal started to look for ways of going around the Muslim countries so they could trade directly with Asia. But it was clear that to do this, new sea routes to the east would have to be found. But to be able to sail such extremely long distances, they had to learn a lot more about the science of navigation, which lets sailors find the positions of the ships at sea, or they could be hopelessly lost. To solve the problems posed by long sea voyages, this man, a prince named Henry the Navigator, from the tiny country of Portugal, founded a school of navigation here on the rocky windswept tip of the European continent. Prince Henry even had this house built for himself a few miles from his school, even further out on the rocky peninsula, in a place where he could be almost completely surrounded by the sea. At his school, Prince Henry gathered together experts to teach Portuguese sea captains new methods of seafaring based on astronomy, and mathematics. Here at the navigation school, these experts developed methods that allowed sailors to steer by learning the position of heavenly bodies using new instruments called the astrolabe and the quadrant. Henry's goal of trying to reach Asia was also made a lot easier by the invention of new types of ships called caravels that had better rudders for steering, as well as improved sails. The ship seen here looks a lot like an early Portuguese caravel. It is a copy of the Mayflower, 
the English ship that carried the pilgrims to Massachusetts. And even though the Mayflower was built 150 years after Prince Henry's death, it still had quite a bit in common with the first caravels. But just like the Mayflower, the earliest caravels sat high in the water, were light and fast, but were still wide enough to be able to carry the large amounts of water and food needed for long months at sea. Here in Lagos, Portugal, not far from his school of navigation, Prince Henry founded shipyards to build new caravels, and with these new ships, and the well-trained seamen coming from his school, the Portuguese started to explore down the coast of Africa. And although Prince Henry's main goal was to find a new trade route to Asia, the Portuguese voyages also had other goals such as to claim land and establish new trading posts that would increase Portugal's wealth and power, and to bring the Christian religion to people in unknown regions of the world. The explorations of the west coast of Africa continued throughout the lifetime of Henry Navigator, but it was not until 1488, 28 years after Prince Henry's death, that the first Europeans sailing under the command of Bartholomew Diaz reached the tip of Africa. And it took ten more years to achieve Prince Henry's final goal of finding a new sea route to Asia. But in 1498, Vasco da Gama, another Portuguese explorer, reached India, where he started Portugal's first great colonial empire. One of the most unfortunate consequences of the early Portuguese explorations was the rebirth of the slave trade. And over the next few centuries, the business of buying and selling human beings became one of the main sources of Portugal's wealth. In the 1480s, over ten years before the Portuguese reached India, this man, an Italian named Christopher Columbus had the idea that Asia could be reached by sailing around the world west from Europe. While living at this monastery in Spain, Columbus was finally able to convince the Spanish rulers, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, to support his unusual project. And by the summer of 1492, here in the muddy waters of the Rio Tinto Harbor, three ships, the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria, awaited his command. And at dawn, the 3rd of August, Columbus's ship sailed out of this harbor on what would become the world's most famous voyage. But things did not go smoothly at first, for along the coast of Africa, rough seas twice caused damage to one of the ships and the sailors had to wait a whole month in the Canary Islands while repairs were made. But on September 6th, Columbus's ships finally sailed west into the unknown waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The ships sailed on for over a month, but as time went by, the crew, having seen nothing but water for so long, began to doubt they would ever see land again. Some feared sea monsters would get them, while others worried that if the world was flat, they might sail off its edge. And after 34 days at sea, they begged Columbus to turn back, but he refused. Columbus's refusal to turn back was one of the most important moments in history. For just two days later, on October 12, 1492, land was sighted. This was the day Columbus had longed for, for he thought he had reached Asia. Little did he know that his long journey from Spain had only carried him to the Bahama Islands, southeast of present-day Florida. Not long after claiming the island he had discovered for Spain, 
Columbus sailed off to do more exploring. He even sent small boats up some of the rivers, searching for the great cities he had heard of. But except for a few native villages, all he found was wilderness. Many years were to pass before the Spanish were to learn that great civilizations existed in this part of the world. In fact, in modern-day Guatemala, this temple still stands in the ancient Mayan city of Tikal, which was abandoned hundreds of years before Columbus was even born. Before returning to Europe in January of 1493, Columbus collected specimens of strange creatures, exotic plants, and even a few native people to show the king and queen. And on one of the larger islands, he left 40 crewmen behind who established a Spanish colony. It was April before Columbus laid eyes on the familiar landscape of Spain again. And when he finally reached the royal court, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella were so pleased with what they learned, they decided to set him up with a fleet of 17 ships filled with supplies, horses, farm animals, and 1,500 settlers for his new colony. But when Columbus got back to his colony, he discovered that all the men he left behind had been killed by the island people, probably because the Spanish settlers had been so cruel to them. However, Columbus soon started a new colony, and then for three years continued his explorations around the Caribbean Sea. And it is interesting to note that even though Columbus returned to the West Indies two more times, when he died, he still believed he had been exploring Asia. But this man, Amerigo Vespucci, had different ideas. During a voyage from 1499 to 1500, he sailed along the coast far south of the Caribbean. This journey and others made him think that the coastline he was seeing belonged not to Asia, but to an unknown continent he called the New World. And when he got back to Europe, Vespucci took advantage of a new invention to publish his ideas, a printing press like this one, which used movable type. And thanks to this invention, his ideas spread rapidly across Europe. So when a new map of the world appeared in 1507, the southern continent was named America, in honor of Amerigo Vespucci, because the map maker mistakenly thought he had been the first European to reach the New World. Actually, the first Europeans got to the New World around the year 1000. They were the Vikings, who explored part of what is today the east coast of Canada. And the first explorers to reach that part of the New World during the Age of Discovery were John Cabot and his son Sebastian, who came from England in 1497 and returned the next year sailing down the coast of North America as far as the Chesapeake Bay. By 1519, there were still some people who thought Asia could be reached by sailing west from Europe. One such man was Ferdinand Magellan, who left this harbor in Spain on September 20th of 1519 with a fleet of five ships and 241 men. A year later, Magellan discovered a passage around the tip of South America, today called the Straits of Magellan. The voyage through this passage was very difficult and took five weeks. But finally, they reached the calmer waters of a vast ocean that Magellan named the Pacific, which means peaceful. Then for over three months, they saw nothing but the endless sea. The men on the ships grew weak because all they had to eat were leather hides, wormy biscuits, and whatever rats they could catch. So with each day, their fear and misery increased. But after sailing thousands of miles west of Cape Horn, 
Magellan's ships reached an island where they could take on fresh water and food. This amazing voyage lasted another year, but it finally ended on September 6, 1522, when a single ship entered the same harbor it had left nearly three years earlier. But that ship carried only 17 men, because all the other 224 crew members, including Magellan himself, had died along the way. But the sailors who survived made history, for they had shown that Asia could be reached by sailing west from Europe. But much more importantly, their voyage proved that the world was round. The same year that Magellan left for Asia, this man, Hernando Cortes, sailed from Spain with a fleet of 11 ships and 600 men to conquer Mexico. At that time, most of Mexico was ruled by Montezuma II, the emperor of the Aztec tribe, whose magnificent capital of Tenochtitlan was built where modern-day Mexico City now stands. This part of Mexico was the center of Mexican civilization. In fact, hundreds of years before the Aztecs, an ancient tribe called Teotihuacans built the enormous temple seen here. In 1519, the Aztecs were the greatest civilization in the New World. But in spite of their greatness, Cortez and his soldiers had some big advantages over them. First, the Spaniards possessed deadly cannons and guns, and the Aztecs did not. Second, the Spaniards possessed strong metal armor to protect themselves from spears and arrows, and the Aztecs did not. And third, the Spaniards had horses to carry men and supplies, and the Aztecs did not. With such powerful weapons, and with the help of other tribes who hated the Aztecs, it took only a few years for Cortes to bring Spanish rule to Mexico. And just ten years later, the forces of Francisco Pizarro brought Spanish rule to Peru as well by destroying the magnificent Inca Empire. After Peru and Mexico fell to Spain, Men such as Coronado and De Soto set off to explore lands that are today part of the southern United States, lands which they claimed for Spain. It was through explorers like these that European nations were able to increase their power by founding colonies throughout the New World. European nations grew richer because of the things their colonies produced, such as gold, silver, furs, sugar, or cotton. But things changed even more in the lands where the colonies were founded. For as European customs were introduced, native customs and languages began to disappear. Here in Mexico, for example, temples where tens of thousands of human sacrifices had been performed each year were torn down and replaced by churches. Missionaries arrived in large numbers, and native people became Christians. European tools and inventions were brought to the colonies, and as more and more settlers arrived from Europe, the native people were sometimes forced to work as slaves in mines and plantations. And as time went by, up to eight-tenths of the native population of the New World died from European diseases. The age of discovery that began in the 1400s brought about changes that have lasted forever. Some were good and some were bad. By expanding knowledge of the world and its people, trade and communication increased. And as more and more ships crossed the great oceans, the different races, cultures, and religions of the world began to learn from one another. And in this way, a foundation was laid down for the modern, interdependent world in which we live today.
In the 1400s, Spanish and Portuguese were inspired to find new routes to the Far East because nations of the religion controlled trade with Asia. This man named founded an important school of navigation in Portugal. Vasco da Gama was the first European to reach by sailing around the Cape of Good Hope. True or false? Christopher Columbus discovered the land that today makes up the United States. New types of ships called were used by many explorers during the Age of Discovery. True or false? Magellan died during his attempt to sail around the world. The Spanish conqueror of Mexico was named The Spanish conqueror of Peru was named True or false Columbus made several voyages to the West Indies during his lifetime. John Cabot sailed to North America in the country of in 1497.